has it. Pollard got light. Danny was gone. And living on a prayer was a hit song. It all happened the first week of March, 1987. From our studios in New York, here again is Stone Phillips. And now a man who doesn't drink, smoke, eat red meat, or stay up past 8 o'clock. A real Boy Scout, you might say. But then again, you'd be wrong. It's Howard Stern, whose Take No Prisoners brand of raunch radio has put him at the top of the heap. And now, ready or not, Howard Stern will be even more exposed in a new movie. Tonight, Howard Does Hollywood. Stand by, please. <coughs> Here we go. Sorry. I really don't know why I step over the line sometimes. I just do. Maybe it's something inside of me fighting to get out. I usually end up feeling like an ass. No, this is not Howard Stern exposing himself on the radio, flashing his private parts verbally over the airwaves, as listeners have come to expect. It's Howard Stern, the actor, polishing his private parts. The movie, that is. Uh, mother. When we first met Howard four years ago at his parents' suburban Long Island home, he was the bad boy of radio. Satan has a mother. A broadcasting outlaw fined by the FCC for indecency, branded by his critics as sexist, racist, and raunchy, and accused of contributing in his own special way to the decline of civilization. Back then, he'd just written the best-selling autobiography that has spawned his movie. Think of the film as Horatio Alger meets Animal House. It chronicles Howard's bumpy ride to stardom. I grow on you like a fungus, Howard warns, and indeed he has. His grand entrance as a Hollywood heavyweight this week is only the latest in a string of knockouts, the crowning achievement for this self-proclaimed king of all media. He has two best-selling books to his credit. His syndicated radio show reaches an estimated audience of 18 million people in 35 cities. He does a nightly cable TV show, and he's raking in millions. For our interview, we thought it fitting to invite Howard back to NBC, his former employer, at 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York. To say he ruffled the peacock's feathers is an understatement. Well, this is uh, certainly weird to be back here because... Hey, Howard. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey. Actually, when I walk into the building, I start remembering the fact that they maybe just get out of the building and I, they only let me take one cardboard box with me. You see, WNBC Radio fired Stern in 1986 for stepping over the line too many times. Hey, Howard. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Now, 11 years later, Howard's back at the scene of the crime heading up to the executive offices where the decision was made to fire him. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. I think my whole life I craved attention. So to know that there was a boardroom filled with 10 and 20 guys all worrying about me was probably some sort of fulfillment of a dream. So the fact that I generated about $5 million worth of income didn't really matter to them. Hello, ladies. I hope I don't run into any management types, although I think all the guys who were responsible for firing me are now gone, which gives me some pleasure. Wow, huh? Look at you. See what happens when you go Hollywood? I look like you now, Stone. Welcome back to 30 Rock. I'm back. I'm triumphant. That's true. Here we are. Here I am. Let's go do it. Look at me. Hey, hey. Hey, now. Boy, you get better looking and better looking. Not one tooth out of Don't place. Don't start with me. Howard hurting. was off and running with that mouth that's been both a blessing and a curse. Can we fade the lights down now, please? Well, yeah, please. Some mood lighting for myself and Stone. You talk about NBC. You talk about the FCC. I mean, isn't it possible that you are your own worst enemy? Well, in a sense, you're right, because I wasn't a great broadcaster, as, as you saw in the movie. <laughs> For me, it was, if I could really crack my head open on the air and literally show you what was inside, everything warts and all, just expose all the raw nerve endings, if I could truly do that, it would be fascinating. Howard? But would it translate onto the big screen? Paramount thought so. And according to the studio, test audiences rated private parts higher than any film in Paramount history, including Indiana Jones and Forrest Gump. What they said was that the movie was outrageously funny, which pleased me because all I ever wanted to do was make a funny movie. I didn't have a bigger agenda than that. But they also said it was romantic and it inspired them to follow their dreams. And in a way, 
I didn't expect to hit those notes with the film. Do you feel like a Hollywood star? No, I don't. I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, th this saga of making a movie uh, has not made me feel like a star. And, and maybe this is something really wrong with me inside. I tell you, I feel like a moron. My father called me a moron my whole life, and I guess it stuck with me. You're a moron! Shut up and sit still! And I gotta still get on the radio tomorrow and do a good show, because you're only as good as your last show. Sit down! And I never feel like I've accomplished anything. Shut up! Despite his insecurity, or perhaps because of it, Howard is constantly flying headlong into controversy. But he never flies solo. On the radio, his co-pilot is Robin Quivers. On the movie set, it was director Betty Thomas. We're happy. When the director said action, were you scared at times? Uh, in the beginning, but Betty made it so easy for me that as it went on, I began to love it. I couldn't wait for her to yell action. I loved getting on set and proving to her whether or not I can act. Why did you decide to play yourself? What made you think you could do it? I didn't know if I could do it. I, I really didn't. And, but that's, that's, that's my whole career. I had never spoken a word on the radio. Or got, I was never able to get up in front of a class and recite, row, row, row your boat. I was so shy and introverted, and yet I knew if I could get on the radio, I'd be good at it. And I felt deep down inside that I could, somewhere in me, felt like I could tackle this movie making and, and, and actually do it. I, I don't know. I just had a belief. And it is kind of crazy when you think about the fact that they had committed millions of dollars to this production, and nobody knew if I could act. That is insane, <laughs> you know, when you think about it. You can't blame a radio station. It's my screw-up. Howard's actually received some favorable reviews for his acting. And some of the scenes are rather unforgettable, but not because he bared his soul. Behold! A lot of bare bottoms in this film, including yours. Yes. And a sorry ass it is, my yes, friend. Is. But is it not an ass bill for comedy? I mean, what, you get laughs with that butt. You know, I'm walking in Times Square. I look up and what do I see? They're plastered to the side of the building, up high, alongside all the beautiful models. A naked Howard Stern. Fabio. With, <laughs> with the caption, never has a man done so much with so little. Yeah. Well, this is a comedy, and it's a self-effacing comedy. I, I have never prided myself on being um, um, uh, a Hollywood movie star or a man who's had a lot in the pants or in the brain. So uh, I think that's a perfect caption. He is self-effacing. But some critics charge that's no defense for degrading others, especially women. The sex talk, the parade of strippers, the constant coaxing of female listeners to bear their breasts in his studio only feeds that furor. Did you sleep with Larry? Well, I... Did I sleep with him? Yeah. You have a lot of female critics, women who say Howard Stern demeans women. This film is directed by a woman. It's based on a book that was edited by a woman. It's about two of the most important women in your life. Right. Your wife, Allison, and your on-air partner, Robin Quivers. Is this your attempt to answer your women critics? No, I, I never set out to answer uh, female critics and somehow have you come away saying, Howard's a great guy. I don't believe I'm sexist at all. I told you that the premise of the show is to actually just blurt out what's on your mind, and I do have sexual thoughts. All guys have sexual thoughts. It is true that there are so many important women in my life, and my best collaborations are with women. But the women he's closest to do sometime take issue with him, as we found out when we spoke to his wife, Allison, back in 93. When Howard starts talking about your private life, your sex life, mm -hmm. does, that, does that embarrass you? Sometimes it gets to me. It depends. You know, some, certain things are exaggerated, and certain things are taken out of context. But, you know, I let him have a good time with it. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> Though Howard pled innocent back then, there's no question that on occasion he has hurt Allison's feelings. Uh, the first time I got into big trouble with Allison yeah. was when um, uh, Allison had a miscarriage, and I brought that up on the air. Because we were joking about it in private. I was trying to cheer her up about it. See, we hadn't joke. discussed whether he was going to discuss it or not. I think I just assumed it was a private incident in our personal life. You thought the fact that she could laugh about that the night before gave you a, right green, a green light. Yeah, right. I guess. I didn't put much thought into it. You know, that's my character flaw. I mean, uh, it's a major one. I, I just don't see anything wrong with doing that stuff. Is there still nothing that's just private in that relationship? That's the, that's the problem in our marriage. And uh, there's very little that is private. And that bothers my wife to this day. Besides, you're married to God now. Your husband's quite a character. Only on the radio. Just an act. <laughs>
My wife does drive in a car with her friends and has to turn off the radio, and she, uh, she gets a hold of me at home, and she does yell at me, just like in that scene with the miscarriage. Allison, if I don't talk about you on the air, Shut and up. I don't talk about Shut me up. on the air, the audience Shut isn't going to be Shut there. Up. We're not going to make any money. Shut up! You disgust me. I can't even look at you, idiot. She does that regularly, and it causes a, it causes a problem because this is a loyal friend. This is a friend who has stood by me. My wife has been incredible to me. You know, when I interviewed you back in 1993, you told me that you have no regrets about anything that you've said or done on the radio, and That's you would true. cross any line. That's true. And yet you say that when you do cross the line, you wind up feeling badly. No. What you're saying That's here is exactly I, usually, I usually wind up feeling like, like an ass. So Howard Stern does care what people think of him. Are you an attorney? No. I don't, uh, care. I guess, okay, I do care what people, that, okay, maybe I do, but I, I think that, yeah, I guess I do. This is 150, take four. Uh, anytime, Howard. From the movie, quote, more than anything, more than anything I'd, like I'd like the, the public, public to appreciate, to appreciate me. me. No, 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 forget that. I want them to love me. Not the myth, but the man. man. The real, real Howard. Yeah, and that's said somewhat sarcastically, but yet it's true. It would be nice to be loved, and I have enjoyed, you know, when critical praise comes about, and that is nice. But will I ever truly be loved? I don't think so. Isn't there a contradiction? I mean, on the one hand, you'll go out of your way to be outrageous, even offensive, and yet you also want to be loved. People who know me in my real life have always been fascinated by that, that there are two Howard Sterns. There's the guy on the air, and there's this really kind of nice, affectionate guy off the air. So which is the real Howard Stern? The real one would be the guy on the air. I suspect none of us have had that unique opportunity to be real. I get it on four hours a day on the radio. Off the air, I'm a complete fake. Um, but that's the, fake, that's the guy I wanted to show in this movie. There is one small audience of three that Howard didn't bring to the premiere. He says if his daughters, ages 4, 10, and 13, do see the film, it'll have to be in the presence of a mental health professional, their mother. You know, my wife's a social worker. She, that was her profession. So she's going to sit with them and watch it. I don't want to be in the room for it. <laughs> she explains my life to these kids. Let the social worker handle yeah, I mean, that. You know, Dad's the incubus, for Christ's sake. But I've always told the kids I'm a Harvard professor, so now I've got to go out and make another film just to show my kids. Do you feel like a grown-up? I mean, because your, your humor is so... Um, juvenile. juvenile. I, uh, yeah, I, I, no, I don't feel like a grown-up. I really feel like I'm still nine years old. I still laugh at, you know, passing wind. And I, I just think that's the greatest. Belching to me is the greatest. I, I, you know, I still laugh at that kind of stupid stuff. So hey. somewhere along the developmental scale, just, you kind of just got stuck back there somewhere. Yeah, and thank God. I mean, God, imagine if I became serious and pompous. It would be awful. It would be the end of my career. I, I, I truly don't feel like I've aged. You know, I don't remember aging. And I, you know, I, I still feel like that little kid. Will you ever grow up? I mean, if it hasn't happened by now, when's it going to happen? Uh, maybe I never matured down there, and I guess I never matured up here. So, you know, there it is. I, I'm still like a baby in both places. You're a moron. Shut up and sit still. But if Howard hasn't matured in those areas, his movie suggests maybe there's another part of him that has, his heart. My wife has real issues with me. And I think in spite of those issues, at the end of the movie, you say, I understand why they're married. I understand the charm of their marriage. I understand the friendship, and I understand the love. And I've never revealed that to an audience before. You know, if the movie is called Private Parts, I better damn well reveal some private parts. The movie opens this Friday, and already Howard's talking about his future as an actor. He told me director Betty Thomas and producer Ivan Reitman have both expressed interest in casting him in another film. Hopefully not a remake of Howard's End. I think we've seen enough of that, if you know what I mean. Still ahead, it's a room at the top where presidents rested and wrote. On those premises, Abraham Lincoln read the Emancipation Proclamation for the first time to his cabinet. But are the Clintons turning it into a place to crash for cash? 